So anytime, take it away. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Wow, it's really great to see people and connect through, uh, through this great opportunity. And I'm super excited to talk about one of my favorite topics as a composer who loves to write for singers and as a singer who loves to sing new music. And um, yeah, so I could talk about all kinds of things tonight and I'm happy to do so. But what also is super interesting is to address your burning questions about writing for the voice. So I'd love to use the comments section for you to um, throw out your questions either as we go or right up in front so that we can guide this conversation to something that, that is tailored to this awesome group of people, which is a diverse group of people. So those questions probably overlap in some cases and maybe are different in other cases. And um, yeah, so I'm also going to just pop into the comments if you want to stay in touch with me. I have my website and also I'm on all the social medias. So Twitter, at Lisa Near. Oh gosh, can I type? Instagram, at Lisa Near Medzo. And then Facebook, you can search Lisa Near Medzo Soprano and Composer and find me. And I share tips about writing for singers um, on occasion and I will be doing that more frequently on those social media and also on my mailing list. So if you want, if you want in on that, you can subscribe to my newsletter and you'll know when those are coming out. So please go ahead and start dropping your questions in the chat. Um, to get us started, I have a fun activity. And I'm wondering, am I able to share a screen, Ted? Oh, I am, sweet, perfect, okay. So we're gonna do a fun activity. I call this Mary's Strange Little Lamb. Oh, whoops, am I sharing now? Can you see the Mary's Strange Little Lamb? Yep. Okay, fantastic. And can you still hear me? Yep. Yes. Awesome. So the way this is going to work yes. best because of Zoom is for everyone to mute yes. yourself except me because we're going to sing this and I'm going to turn on metronome so that we can hear a pulse. And our goal is to sing this um, as written. So I'm going to set us to 4-4. Four, four. Okay, so let's see, is everyone on mute except me? Or this is gonna get real confusing. Cool, okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, one, two, Mary ha Oh, I should give us a, I should give us a starting pitch. Hmm, there's a note, okay? All right, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Oh, I see, it's really hard to do. Let me slow it down a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna give us one measure for free, then one, two, three, and we have to start mare on beat four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Okay, so I'm gonna stop screaming, sharing. How was that for people? Did it feel kind of wonky? Felt like my mind just flipped it back to normal somewhere along the way. Yeah, at some point the mind tries to correct, and that is an example I want you to hold close to your heart because <laughs> it was a beat early. The whole thing was a beat early. The whole thing was a beat early, right? Which is not a really great way to represent the way the music works, right? The music is very square, and um, it does not actually sound like the way I just wrote it out. I specifically shifted it. So if there is one, if there is one like cardinal rule I can send out to all of you lovely people, it is that vocal music works best when accented words and accented syllables of the word line up with accented beats and accented divisions of the beat. 
Jesus. Okay. So what I did was I undid that. Let's look at the score again. Let's see. Somebody, can, I think it might help maybe someone to mute themselves unless they have a question to ask. I think somebody's not on mute. And just it gets kind of a lot of chatter. So Either that or turn your podcast off. <laughs> Either that or turn your podcast off. So as the music should be set normally, the word Mary would start on beat one. And then we would have that Mary had a little lamb. The accented syllables and the stressed words would line up with the accented beats, beats one and three. But I specifically for this example, offset them to show you what not to do. So I see versions of this, more complicated versions of this all the time in early drafts of music that people are working on for singers. And it's not that it's wrong to do syncopation. It's actually very different to do purposeful, beautiful, super cool, groovy syncopation versus accidental shifting of where the accented syllables and the accented divisions of the beat lie. And great confusion happens because when we all tried to shift it back to the way we knew it was supposed to be, that's what the brain is constantly telling the singer. That is what the brain is constantly telling the instrumentalists, especially collaborative pianists who are used to reading the text and following along and are often singers themselves. So if you're writing art song or choral music in particular, the instrumentalists, especially pianists who work with singers and also all other very sensitive instrumentalists who work with other people and singers will find this a hard thing to connect because everyone will keep trying to shift. So. That leads me to our next fun activity, which is a little bit of text setting. So, or rhythm, rhythm experimentation. Okay, so I'm gonna share a screen again. And what I'm gonna ask you to do, these are two very short texts. If you've got a piece of paper handy, I'm gonna ask you to jot them down and then you're going to underline stressed syllables or important words that are single syllable words. Sometimes a single syllable word is important, right? So if I said, the dog ran to the park, ran, dog, these are single syllable words, but they are clearly more important than the article the, or the helping connecting words to the, the dog ran to the park. Dog, ran, and park are the more important words. They're all single syllable. Or, as we'll see in a moment, I'm going to share our screen. Here we have two short texts. Some of them have single syllables. Some of them have multiple syllables. I'm just going to invite you to take a second and jot down what you think those accented syllables and accented words are. I'm going to start to write in my ideas. So if you want to complete this without thinking about what I'm doing, just don't look at it for a second.
Okay. So this is what I came up with. And some of this could be subjective with what you want to emphasize. A turtle fence, so I did the first couple on top and I don't know how to erase. A turtle fence is exactly what you think it is. It is a fence that keeps turtles from getting hit by cars. That's how I hear it. That's how I would say it. You might have some slightly different ways of emphasizing the text, and that can be really cool and fine. But it's definitely not a turtle fence is exactly what you think it, well, maybe what you think it, maybe, right? It is a, it is a fence, right? One of my theater teachers, because we talk about this in acting as well, we call these operative words in, in acting. Um, she talked about how basically operative words are the opposite of what newscasters <laughs> emphasize. So if you listen to newscasters, they will be emphasizing these, these kind of strange choices and what they emphasize sometimes as a part of the speech pattern maybe that they're supposed to do to keep your attention, you know? Tonight at seven! You know, it, it's very strange. To the 19 squirrels who are sitting in a circle on my front lawn, what are you planning? So that's how I hear them. Does anyone have questions about that? Um, this is what I do with any text that I'm going to set. This is what I do with any text I'm going to sing. I take it away from the music and I look at what the words are. I look at what the important words are, the operative words, what the syllables, the stressed and unstressed syllables are, even in my own language, even more so in a language that I don't speak natively. And I think, likewise, this is important to do when you're setting a language you speak natively and more important even to do in a language you're not a native speaker of. So. Can I ask a quick question? This please time? do. So once again, this is like the idea of taking the words and trying to fit them into music, correct? Mm -hmm. Sure. So you want to yeah. like, do you want to try to like kind of musicalize the words and kind of rhythmicize the words and then think about sure. creating music? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so this is the next, oh, it got rid of my little thing, but that's okay. So the next, the next fun activity we could do, but I didn't think to make you all bring staff paper, but you can do this on your own, is it's fun to take a text and just set it rhythmically. Oh, somebody already did it. Yay. Okay, cool. So there, that can be really fun is to just set a text to a rhythm after you've done this to think of like, what, what kind of time signature would I give this? What kind of um, subdivisions would I need? So for example, let's share screen again. It got rid of my annotations, but that's okay. Uh, a turtle fence is exactly what you think it is. It is a fence. So to me, it is a fence. It is a, that's three pickups to fence. So some options for that might be a triplet. It is a fence. That could work. Um, the second eighth of a beat plus two more eighths, one, two, three, it is a fence leading into the downbeat, a strong beat in like four, four time. Um, how could we do this? Uh, I mean, again, in six, eight time, I could decide I'm gonna use like the second big beat. One, two, three, it is a fence because the downbeat of the next measure will be metrically stronger, okay? So those are ways to take this idea and start to think about what rhythms will fit this text and let the text be really well understood and spill out of the voice in a way that seems idiomatic to the language. So now I'm going to show you what I came up with in the actual piece. And Drew has a hand up because Drew has actually sung this, um, this piece. So Drew is the expert in snapshots. So this is my setting of this text, the turtle fence text. Um, so why don't we just for fun, let's just clap and let's read the rhythm. We don't have to worry about notes. So we'll skip beat one, we'll skip measure one. One, two, three, a uh, turtle fence. One, two, three, a uh, turtle fence. One, two, three. A turtle fence is exactly what you think it is. 
It is, and then I have this free time. So it is a fence that keeps turtles from getting hit by cars. However, the singer chooses to say that almost like a recitative. So it's not the only way to set a text, but that is how I set this text and everybody gets to set them as they want. But this is a common challenge that I see in early drafts of music is a text that was set without thinking maybe through some of the implications of the natural word stresses. And it really starts to make really cool music happen when you incorporate that. And also music that sings very well. So my goals are always, why do we write for singers? If we're writing with the text, we want to express the text in some way, whatever cool way that is. And we want that to come across to the audience. We want it to be expressive and effective in the voice and we want it to rehearse effectively because we all know that rehearsal time is at a premium and we want the musician to spend it on the cool stuff, like making our music super awesome and expressive um, and minimize the parts that are tricky to put together to like the really cool stuff that's worth it and not stuff the, the whole time through that's gonna bog your rehearsal down and not let your musician shine. That's my, that's my philosophy as a composer and as a singer. Cool. Questions about any of that? Could I just make a comment? I really thought it was cool that um, you had that kind of like that bar where there was like the X's in mm -hmm. the time signature to where it was just like, all right, just the musicians arpeggiate this and then it's almost like a, like a vocal cadenza, totally. right? Thanks, yeah, it's super cool, that, that free time. Yes, that to me, I like just, we only saw the score for like two minutes, right? But like <laughs> literally learned so much just from looking at the score and seeing that like, okay, this is a moment where you're just like, you open it up and let the singer do their thing. And then you just come in on that, on a literal hit point. Quote yeah. Unquote. Like <laughs> that was really, I, that was really cool. Really cool. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, that is a great thing. So if we think about like, if we back up, we, we dug into tech setting because- Can we what see is the a, score again? Yeah, for sure. What is something, why, why use singers? This actually might be, be like one of the other most important things to think about. Why do you write for a singer? I write for a singer because singers are experts in delivering text. I write for singers because singers are experts in telling stories. I write for singers because singers are experts in expressing the range of human emotions through different vocal colors that are almost impossible to quantify, but can be accessed through a range of things such as dynamic markings, expressive markings, dramatic indications. I write for singers because a singer is a body on stage with very little in between them and the audience, which is a very interesting dramatic thing to do. They can gesture, they can move, they can stomp their feet, they can clap their hands. Singers can do everything from speak words to whisper words, to sing words, to half sing, half speak words, to make nonsense syllables, to, um, there's a score that I have performed, there's a piece I've performed by David Vio that has almost no singing and almost entirely stage directions metered out in musical time but it is basically a piece of performance theater and singers can do that as well. So that's why I write for singers. Um, and I think that taking advantage of those things is one of the things that makes your pieces for voice shine. Thinking about why am I writing for, why am I writing this piece for a singer versus a flute player versus a trumpet player versus a timpanist? Um, yeah. Cool. Lisa? Uh, yeah. Hi. I have a question, but it relates to the chorus, the idea of writing for chorus. For I chorus, go for it. Yeah. So much choral music, either on the radio or in a live performance or whatever, where if I did not have the text printed in front of me, I would have no clue as to what the words were. Sure. And I don't know, I don't have a solution for that. Because mm -hmm. for me in core writing, including my own, it's the music that is most important. And that's what mm. I want to get across. And the words stimulate me to create the kind of ambience, mm -hmm. mood, the imagery mm -hmm. that I do 
uh, for the singers. Mm -hmm. But still, I know when an audience is listening to it, they are, there's just no way, particularly if it's, uh, let's say, a complex harmonic uh, context mm -hmm. or a rhythmic context that has mm -hmm. been involved as well. Um, I had experience quite some time ago where I was working at a university and um, the university happened to invite Ned Roram out there. This was about three days after the guy got the Pulitzer Prize. Wow. So he came out there walking on a bit of a cloud and he listened to this, this 10 minute piece that I had written, which is pretty complex. And he came up to me afterwards and he said he liked the piece a lot, but he could not understand a word. And mm -hmm. I told him, I agree with you. Jeez. And, you know, we didn't have time to talk more about that. He was pleasant enough. But there's a guy that has written, good Lord knows what, uh, for chorus, singers, et cetera, and instrumental, of course. Um, but I always have this question. When I hear a choral piece, there is like no way I know most of the words that they are singing, mm -hmm. even if it's a homophonic setting. Hmm. Now, if I'm listening to Bach's Mass in B minor, I don't care. I know what Kyrie is on, and okay. et cetera, et cetera, the sure. Latin text for the masses. You know, Bach wouldn't care either. <laughs> um, his, the glory of the music is, is what I'm going for, not the glory of the words, whatever. So is there any kind of solution to something like what I am proposing there? Yeah. Or what I am asking, I guess. Gosh, there are a lot of things that you just brought up. So I think one thing to be aware of whenever we're writing for any kind of instrument or voice is who are we writing for and what is their level of expertise? And one of the wonderful things about the choral world, there are so many choirs of all kinds of experience levels. And even at a college level, you might have very advanced voice majors along with wonderful singers who haven't had individual voice lessons or haven't been involved in music beyond choir since they started college, maybe. So you're going to have a lot of variety of expertise levels in that choir. And that's a very different thing than hearing resonance ensemble in town, <laughs> you know, um, which is, you know, a group of maybe 16 of us singing, you know, and we're professionals, right? But as a composer, how can we hedge our bets? I mean, I think first of all, we have to know that like we put our music into the world and, you know, there's going to be all kinds of experience levels who perform it for sure. Some of the challenges that come up with choral writing are um, two or more vowels happening at the same time in um, like contrapuntal textures where one set of singers is singing one text and another set of singers is singing another text. And what this does is Vowel sounds are frequencies. They're not exactly, they're frequencies that can be, you know, layered upon the pitch frequency that we hear, but they are a frequency and they can start to distort one another. So if the sopranos and altars are singing an E vowel and the tenors and basses are singing an A vowel, that's going to get kind of mixed up. Likewise, what's going on with our consonants, which usually the, the vowels are stretched out more, right? The consonant sounds are shorter, but they're very important for that word identification. So are those consonants, again, getting kind of cluttered or are they distinct? Are we introducing text maybe in a simpler way, in a cleaner way, in a more homophonic way or in one voice part or two voice parts singing in homophony while others maybe hold something or something? Are we introducing new text that way? and then letting all the cool weaving lines happen where the audience, okay, now we're repeating text and we get it. Those are some ways to clarify your text. And also knowing that when we think about range, um, as we'll, I, th I think we'll probably touch on um, later, but the higher the range in the voice, the more singers have to open their mouths and the more difficult it is to make certain vowel and consonant sounds. And if you're talking about choral ranges, choral ranges are more condensed than solo ranges. And so a high note for an alto who is mostly singing in choir is lower than a high note for a mezzo-soprano who is used to singing solo. So that 
distortion where the mouth is opening, where we're losing some clarity. Maybe in certain vowel sounds or certain consonant sounds have to be shorter. That can also come in and be a little amplified because of the reduced range from singers who maybe aren't developing that higher extension in those, those techniques as far. So those are a few things um, that come to mind. But also I, I noticed that you said you didn't always really mind that you couldn't understand the text, like that you were into it for the music. And I think um, while I want to, my, my mission in life is to, you know, evangelize everyone into writing awesome music for singers and into taking advantage of the wonderful text properties. But it's not the case that everyone's priorities in every piece are to have the text perfectly clear all the time. And that is something you can think about and sit with and make a decision for you, you know? Um, most of the music I write so far, that has been a very front and center. But certainly we can think of pieces like a, a Kyrie where maybe our audience already knows that text or a non, maybe a, a sound effect noise kind of piece or uh, just, you know, a piece where you're going for mood, you know? Um, so those are some ideas, you know? Um, I hope that helps. Uh, clarity seems to fade as choral size grow. Great, that's a great um, point also, Hunter. Yes, um, lining up those consonant sounds is more challenging in a larger group, for sure. I also think like uh, the most elite choirs right now are on the smaller side, right? I mean, it's just more expensive <laughs> to have all, all, um, all professional singers, right? And so um, the, more, the more training that your singers have, probably the smaller choir. And the larger the choir doesn't necessarily mean that there are uh, at a, a different experience level, but sometimes it does. Um, yeah. Especially do you want... with COVID. Especially with COVID. Oh goodness. Yes. COVID changes a lot of things. Um, yeah, that's a great question, David. And I'd, I'd love to keep chatting with you about that. Um, Hunter well, is think, asking, yeah, go for it. I was just going to mention that in choral music, and I'm thinking here, not soul singers, but really choral music. It is the music that is going to be dominant for the composer. And hopefully the text can be expressed um, there. That's hopefully the text is what gave the composer the, the impulse to create the mood and to write what they do, uh, no matter what the style period might be. And I think for people listening to choral music of any kind, if the music sucks, who cares <laughs> about the word, really? It's Amen like an to opera. In opera, you know, if the, the story can be one thing. Story might even be terrible a week, but if there's some great music in there, that's going to always be the forefront of making hmm. it a success. Same thing with Broadway, with musical theater. Uh, music always comes first, but the words can be the stimulus for the composer to really make something happen in that regard. Yeah, I think, so. I mean, I think that's a really beautiful, you've really found your philosophy and that's really awesome. I have a different philosophy as an actress. I don't so much care. I want to tell a story or I want to express something. Uh, and that's what I tell my singers when they're getting ready to sing for a recital is I tell them, great, you're, you've worked on your technique. You know, your technique's not going anywhere in the next day. Your musicality's not getting magically better overnight. Just go tell the story and sell it and express yourself. Um, so I think that's what's so great about like music is it doesn't always have to be one thing and some pieces may be one thing for one person and one thing for another person. And yeah, certainly when I write choral music, ooh, that text is like, that that's front and center for me. That's just how I work. But that's, you know, that's why it's so great to have these conversations is because we can inspire each other and, and learn from one another, which is awesome. Uh, Whoa, these are so great. Okay, I love this, that we're getting all these questions now. So Hunter, small ensembles of singers, Hunter is asking about. Hunter, I can't remember. Have we met in person yet, Hunter? We have not. I just followed you on Twitter. Hi, I'm so yeah. glad to see your face and interact. Great. So can you tell me a little bit more about the challenges you're, you're finding with writing these smaller ensembles? Oh, I'm just curious. I have... I've, um, I'm sort of new to vocal composition. I'm a mm -hmm. instrumentalist, former wind player. That's right. But 
So I, uh, I've mostly been writing for solo voice, but I'm just curious because it seems like there's like timbral and like large ensemble textures you can get. And yeah, you know, I, I sort of get the impression that I could probably get away with more sloppy writing. Right? I know that sounds bad, <laughs> but I feel like I could probably write sloppier music for choir and have it sound decent than if I had, say, a single soprano, a single alto, a single tenor, and a single bass sing that same oh. music. Like, say, say I'm writing specifically for a small ensemble of singers. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what sort of challenges does that present, and how can you overcome those? Sure. I think when you're, when you're talking about, if you talk about a small ensemble, like a small, um, like a cappella, let's say, sort of singing in, like, let's say we have that quartet. I think one of the first things you have to know is that the small ensemble is going to have to plan their breaths precisely together. In a large choral ensemble, people can sneak catch breaths, which means they might be singing a long phrase and they might grab a sip of air in the middle of a word or at the end of a word and just not sing the last consonant because the, the choral director will tell people don't have an audible breath until these points. But then if it's too long, people can kind of hop out and sip. So they might be saying, alleluia, or something like that. But in a four part, that's never gonna work. An eight part, that's never gonna work. In resonance with 16 part, no way. We tell each other where we're catch breathing and you better take your catch breath there and not anywhere else <laughs> because there'll be a gap. So that's one of the most important things to think about. I think the other thing to think about if you were thinking like of two voice writing, say, um, and maybe there would be another, maybe there would be an instrument, maybe there wouldn't be. But um, that kind of going back to some of the ideas that we have from voice leading, if you took for part voice writing or, or part writing in a college or high school course of theory, those rules come out of Renaissance and, you know, Baroque vocal writing. And those practices came to be because voices work well that way. Voices work well where there's not a gap of over an octave between voices except the two bottom voices. Voices work well with tighter packed, um, like with tighter packed intervals in the higher voices because that puts the smaller intervals more in line with where they would be on the harmonic series. Uh, so if you're talking about like a duet and the duet partners start to be off from like, you know, an octave and a fifth or two octaves and maybe there's no instruments, let's say, that's, it's doable. It's just gonna be a little more challenging sometimes because the singers aren't as used to tuning a cappella intervals that are larger than an octave or so. It'll sound um, really thin too. It could, it could sound super cool. Like it's not a bad thing at all, but it's just something to think about. Um, singers often in a choral situation or in a solo situation are thinking horizontally. We're thinking, how do we get from this note to the next, right? So those really big leaps, those are more challenging, especially if there's sort of an, um, a thin texture that doesn't underpin that, right? I mean, so certainly if you've got a big old C major chord and you ask me to jump from C to C, that's fine, right? That's not a problem, right? C to E, like an, an octave and a third, that's a big jump, but you know, you can find it. But if there's no supporting harmony under there, or if it's two voices, then I would, I would be aware of that for sure. Um, but I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily I would write for whatever ensemble you want to write for. I would write for whatever choir or singers you have. If you've got four friends who are going to sing for you, write for them. Write for people who are going to sing your music. If you've got a choir who's going to sing your stuff, write for them and write for their level of experience so that they will really, really shine. And oh, then they will sure. love it and all of that. I'm yeah. a hobbyist, so I always write for the friends I can coerce into playing stuff. Perfect. Write for them. Yeah. Write for them, write it, and learn by doing. And um, yeah, I think that's great. So fantastic. OK, cool. Could I ask Hunter a question here? And you just mentioned there was you wrote some sloppy writing. We did some sloppy writing. I've never heard that term before. What do you mean, sloppy <laughs> writing? I haven't actually written for choir before, but I feel like the um, it, it, there's more texture and warmth in a choir, I feel like, as opposed to solo voice. 
And so I feel like the, uh, the counterpoint seems like it'd be a lot more exposed when you're writing for individual singers and put in, in a higher relief, I guess, if that makes sense. I hadn't thought about specifically, thought about it specifically in like super great detail. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Certainly it's gonna be different to hear two solo singers is different than hearing two parts with, with four or eight people on them. It will sound more sort of isolated for sure, you know, but I don't think that's a bad thing. And I don't necessarily think one is harder than the other. I think you just, you just wanna write, write with that sound in your mind, you know? And as you write, you'll get that sound in your mind more because you'll write the thing and they'll sing it and send it back to you and it'll be awesome. Drew's asking about, uh, the process of transposing art songs for different voice types. I am a huge fan of transposing. I think transposing is awesome. I think that um, that it all opens up our, our songs to more people. So that's, that's awesome. Some things you want to keep in mind. Uh, traditionally, an art song range is more condensed than an aria range. So in a Rossini aria, I might sing from the G below middle C to the B flat, two B flats above middle C. Okay, so basically the entire mezzo-soprano range may be used. This is not typical for art song, okay? Typical for art song, an octave and a third to an octave and a fifth is typical for art song. So if you have written a super cool art song that has a very, very wide range, that's cool. You've got an awesome singer who sings it, but now you want to transpose it down. It may not map as well. So a good example are my lovely friends who are high coloratura sopranos with a great low extension, and they're singing the E, that high E above high C, and they're singing my low G. Well, my low G as a professional mezzo soprano is kind of my lowest concert soloist note. And if you bump this piece down high enough, if you, if you bump it down a fourth, so I, the, now the highest note instead of that high E is the high B, or really a tritone, the B flat, now that low note is not in my range anymore. It's just not, it's not gonna sound. So if you've written a very rangy piece, it's not gonna transpose very well across the different voice types. The other thing you wanna keep in mind is are you writing an art song traditionally with like a piano accompaniment? This could change a lot. Lowering the piano accompaniment to a new key could change your fingering, could make certain things not very playable. It could also change the muddiness, especially down low, right? If you moved things down quite a bit, it could make those low notes much more dark and rumbly and might not speak as cleanly. And so your texture may sound different. So I really suggest when you're doing a transposition, to call up your friend who's a pianist and ask them if they'll sight read it for you if you're not a pianist and give you their honest opinions. And also the great thing is if you are writing in that traditional art song range of an octave and a third or an octave and a fifth ish, you will have some options if the pianist is like F sharp major, no, F major, yes. I'm sort of speaking as if it's in a tonal key, but do you hear what I'm saying? Certain fingerings, a half step transposed up or down could make a huge difference to your pianist and not that big of a difference sometimes to your singer if you have the wiggle room because you haven't written for the whole extreme. So those are the things I would think about, but I think transpositions are great. Um, I especially think they are great for things like art song and songs for young high school or middle school or elementary singers. Please, there is a huge need for children's and middle school songs by composers who are living today that are singable, that are available in many keys. I've got some young men in my studio or some, some young, I should say, 2B tenors or baritones in my studio. These 2B tenors or baritones, their range is so tiny and even the kids' art song book is too high for them. So if you write like range of an octave songs for kids and give them to me in many keys, I will love you and other voice teachers with 2B tenors and basses changing voices will love you too. They really will. So that's my, that, that is my sense on that. Um, yeah. 
Oh, this is so great. Okay. Are there helpful tools to keep in mind for how to write for certain vocal ranges for musical theater? Absolutely. So if we're talking about musical theater, Jeff, the voice ranges are part of it. And the other part for soprano and mezzo or alto roles is the character that you're going for. So traditionally in the musical theater realm, we have for the stereotypically female voices, for the soprano and the mezzo voices and alto voices, the treble clef reading voices, we have legit, which is a more, more towards classical style, a more light soprano-y sound. And we have belters. And belter may or may not be someone who would sing soprano in a classical setting or someone who would sing mezzo or alto in a classical setting. So part of the determination for the soprano and mezzo singing characters is going to be whether you want them to be belting or not. Um, then for the tenor and bass and baritone roles, those characters, because of the qualities of those voices, are kind of considered belters anyway because of the dominance of the chesty sound in those voices traditionally. So finding the right melody is part of your range. I mean, you definitely want to choose the voice part you're writing for before you write and be working with that in mind because otherwise you're going to write some melody that you fall in love with and it doesn't work. <laughs> Right? And I think the same thing orchestrationally. What other instruments are, are playing with these? You know, what other instruments do you imagine? Because, you know, if you think you're going to write for flute and now it's too low, that's not going to work. You know, so um, I have a range. I have a range chart. It's not specific to musical theater, although we could we can email and chat. Um, but if anybody, anybody who wants the range chart, I'll email them. If you, you know, anybody who signs up for my mailing list. Uh, on my website, I'll put that here again. I'll, if you sign up um, tonight, I'll send you my um, my range and tessitura, or I'm sorry, my range, my range kind of practical and um, yeah, range and tessitura chart. I'm sorry for classical, and then we can chat about musical theater, which is a slightly different beast. Um, yeah, absolutely. Matt is talking about the the performance hall. The performance hall matters no matter what you're doing. I mean, choral especially because of the number of voices and a really excellent choir and a really excellent choral conductor will be able to modify from a really reverberant hall to a drier hall. Um, and, you know, a high school choir with, you know, singers who are, are newer, they may not adjust as much on a dime. It's just part of, it's part of working with, with whatever ensemble you're working with. Um, yeah, highly chromatic. Let's talk about highly chromatic. So um, my, my earlier I said cardinal rule, if I can have you leave with one thing, was um, please, please line up accented words and accented syllables with accented beats and accented divisions of the beat as much as artfully possible, except again, unless you're doing some kind of cool groove thing that's awesome. My next cardinal rule for you, repeat after me, pitch finding is a fundamental property of the instrument. This has nothing to do with your singer being a good singer or a bad singer. A good instrument, like a good musician or a bad musician has nothing to do with that. I really need us, as we move forward as composers, to move into a place where we understand that pitch finding for the singer is the same as asking that cellist to stretch too far. Right? There are those stretches for string players where like, maybe they're going to kind of, maybe I can kind of foochel something and get it right. Uh, it can kind of jury rig something and get it right like sometimes, but not all the time. And then you do it a bunch and it's like almost none of the time because it's not really a feasible stretch. And that's, that's pitch finding for singers. So unless you're working with a per pitch perfect singer, a perfect pitch singer, and there's not many of them, so I don't recommend banking on that. You're going to have to provide a harmonic or pitch basis of some kind to your singers. So I have a couple strategies for you. One is you, you feed your singers some pitches and some supporting material. Let's take a look at what Ives does. I'm going to share a screen. 
Let's see, where did that go? Okay. So this is the first page of Evening by Charles Ives. Let's see if I can increase the size on this here. He's a highly chromatic song by Ives. But you'll see that he provides pitches for the singers so that the singer has some stability. So we hear the B flats early and often. B flat, B flat, B flat. There's a B flat up there, there's a B flat up there, there's a B flat there, there's a B flat there. Okay, so one of the things I think that people think about when they want chromaticism is they feel like the chromaticism has to be one performer doing one note and another performer has to do a different crunchy dissonant interval and they may not overlap. But when you are writing art song, you've got a pianist with five fingers on each hand and the audience is going to hear chromaticism and dissonance whether or not that is in the same instrument or in two different instruments. And so you may as well give the singer a little help, right? So here Ives has got B flats and he's got B naturals. You're gonna hear that dissonance. Also, when you're talking about art song, piano has a super fast decay. I guarantee you the audience doesn't really notice it. Singers have an attack that's a vowel or, or a consonant, I'm sorry. On many words, we have an attack. Now, came, Still, evening on, and twilight, those consonants are going to obscure that attack from the piano or kind of meld it all together till it's one texture. So if Ives wrote instead of having this B flat, the F and the B natural and, and the D only, would the singer figure it out? Sure. Would it take a much longer time? Yeah. Is this a way, way better use of our time? Yes. It's a way, way better use of our time. Is Ives already hard enough? Who sung Ives? <laughs> yeah, Ives is hard enough. Ives is totes hard enough, okay? So Ives does this all the time, okay? Where he is giving the singer a pitch support. Here's, here's the E hidden down here, right? It's in the middle of a chord. It's in the middle of a chord. We've got all this cool like whole steps and half steps happening. It's super cool. You don't feel like you're harmonically bored at all in Ives. Um, so other things about dissonance is notice how much this is stepwise. Okay. So this is helpful. Remember I said that singers read horizontally. So if you're wondering about your line, try sight reading it. Try sight reading it on solfege. <laughs> Pull that baby out. Okay. And see, because that's what the singer is going to do. The singer is going to try to see even even in, um, I do, I do um, solfege in like movable dough, and then I also do absolute dough for chromatic and atonal music, okay? So the singer's gonna do that. So if you're writing atonal music, that's fine. Sing an absolute dough, it's a good experience. And you find that, you find those leaps and see how linearly are we gonna, are we going to find these pitches? And what's the thought process? The thought process before I come in is, who's giving me my note? or who's giving me a note from which I can easily measure my note, right? That's fine. That's fine to do. The fifth below, major second below, if it's clearly voiced, I can do that. Um, that's fine. You know, a younger singer, a high school singer, not so much, right? So it depends on who you're writing for always. Let's look at another example. I'm gonna show you The Vulture by Jonah Elrod. So the Vulture was written for me in 2014 for the One Voice Project. I've sung it many, many times. Uh, Jonah does what I think is, he does two things that are really awesome in this piece that I want people to think about. One is, he uses what I call anchor pitches. So he uses certain pitches as notes that we come back to, and this creates a pitch memory for the singer. So that within that piece, some of those chromatic leaps or some of those departures and returns they do work their way into the inner ear, into the inner brain. The other thing he does is, which I love, is that he often returns to motivic content at the same pitch level. 
That's really helpful too, because it increases that pitch memory. It's not the only thing you can do, but it's a great way to help your singers out um, and to write idiomatically for the singers. So here we go. So here he has his anchor pitch of D. Okay, we come back to the D. And then this other motive always begins on the A flat, okay? So throughout the whole piece, I have to hold D and A flat. I have to hold that tritone in my mind. Because at a certain point, I'm not actually measuring up a tritone anymore. I'm just returning to that pitch I've, I've held in my brain. I mean, I get it at the beginning of the piece, but I'm not measuring down a tritone. I'm returning to the tritone I've kept remembering, okay? So he has, has the A flat. We end on, we end on F. Okay, now he's got some um, whispered kind of consonant sounds and this is where we might be in danger of forgetting our pitch and losing that pitch centricity. But luckily, since there's not too many pitches to remember, he comes back to D here and that's really, really helpful. Okay, um, and again, on this page, okay, we've got the, the A flat again. So that's really helpful. What is uh, a lot more challenging for the singer, what is a lot more challenging is if um, motives never come back at pitch level or they never come back at interval level. So to have an, a motive that happens and then when you come back to it, it's got instead of a half step then a whole step, now you have a whole step then a half step. Now both those motives seem confusing and learning one right has now messed up the other and vice versa. It's not wrong, but I've seen pieces where like literally there isn't a single thing that repeats, not a single pattern of intervals. I'm not even talking about like the same rhythm happening, that's fine, but it like it's always some different thing and like truly three pages of music where everything is actually different, like where nothing ever comes back. That's that's a lot, especially, well, just it's just a lot for anybody. I mean, imagine on your own instrument what that would be. Um, so those are some of my suggestions, Charles, is um, one, to, to trust that if you double that, those, crunchy, those crunchy dissonances, if you give a few of them to the singer that no one's going to say, hey, your minor second was played in the piano and the singer sang one note of it. Nobody's going to care, really. Nobody, the singer's going to care. Singers get really good, new music singers get really good at picking out which one of those two, two notes is right because the harm, harmonics, right, are then both ringing. But if, you, if you've got the piano, say, if we're doing an art song, playing something and I'm supposed to sing a half step away from it, I can do it, but every single thing in my brain is telling me I'm wrong because every single frequency is telling me I am wrong. Right? And then if I need to switch back and actually sing a consonance, then I've got to know which, when am I doing that, right? So it, it can be done, but that little signal, and also, and I guess the other thing I'll say, it's got to be, the signal has to be before, you know? So, so if the piano is playing all these, you know, disparate things, and then, I, and then right on my note, there's my note, that doesn't help me either. So notice that Ives gave the the, D, the B flat early, yay, because if if it's on the if it's on the entrance of the singer, and it's really that first that first entrance, and then we can go from there for a while, you know, that's okay. I'm talking about some fairly advanced singers here, not your high schoolers or your undergrads necessarily. Um, yeah. It's interesting to hear this from the perspective of a former woodwind player, because I mean, I was a bassoonist, so I spent probably. 80, 80 to 90 <coughs> of my playing time not hearing myself so you like sort of take it on faith that you're playing in tune and you you just like at least as a wind player practice I practice in such a way that I just became so familiar with how each note felt that even without hearing myself I could take it on faith that I was at least pretty close so it just it, it's yeah. interesting hearing the uh, different approach mm -hmm. to pitch yeah it seems like it seems like a finding pitch. There's a lot in common between string players and singers, more so than say <clears throat> singers and woodwind players or strings and woodwinds. Yeah, I think that's a fair. I think that can that's a fair um, 
simil simile to make. You know, I think singers don't have a tactile connection to where each pitch is. The same pitch may feel different depending on vowel, what I've sung before, what time of day it is, how long have I been talking and teaching today? Today, a long time, right? So those low notes might feel lower if the low notes are getting kind of tired at the end of the day. The high notes might be harder to access or, you know, singers get good at this, but it's not enough to pitch find and not enough to be magically in tune, right? I mean, so, um, yeah, so it's it's not uh, it's not impossible. Uh, it's just it's a property of the instrument, you know. And you can check this. This is what I want everyone. I don't care if you ever ever do it in public. Please sing your stuff. I don't care if you sing it down the octave and then up the octave or whatever. Hit transpose on Sibelius and or finale and put it in a in a key or start from a starting pitch if it's atonal. Put it in a starting pitch that you can do. But can you sing it? Can you sing it? Can you find these notes? If you can, that's that's a good sign, you know? If you can, except for a couple weird spots, someone can probably figure that out with practice, you know? Um, so, wow, this is awesome. Okay, we've got a lot of great questions. Um, what techniques do I employ when writing for eight versus 16 versus 100 voices? Well, Eight, the question is always, am I writing for eight parts or am I writing for four parts, two to a part? Um, I'm going to assume, well, I'm not going to assume. A hundred voices are not going to be, you, you're going to have a lot more of that messiness as a, as a possibility uh, that, um, that David was talking about. So, so a hundred voice choir you know that's a that's a lot of that's a lot of s's and k's to line up for the consonants so um i'm gonna write a little cleaner for 100 voices i'm gonna write i'm gonna i'm gonna take advantage of Debussy with 100 voices i'm gonna have a section where soprano split into soprano one soprano two for a while and maybe no one else sings you know and if it's eight voices that's real thin it's cool but it's a real different sound to have soprano one and soprano two do two different things. You know, now we're talking about two exact lines of music, very clean, very isolated, very exposed. You know, um, what is that? 25, 12 soprano ones and 12 soprano twos. <laughs> that's, a, that's still a pretty full sound. Um, yeah, I think 16, again, I'm gonna think, I, I don't really write default eight part music. Most of the time for choirs, you can, but it's harder to get performed. I tend to write SATB with some DVC or with no DVC. If like I have a choir director who's like, do not, do not, do not divide, then I'm like, okay, four parts. If it's eight person or 16 person choir, I'm still going to mostly do, I'm still going to, I personally am still going to mostly do SATB and then save those divisions for when I really have a cool chord I want to do or for if I'm really going to do like, alto and tenor voices and I want to maybe flesh something out. You can write 16 distinct voices. It's honestly not going to be performed as much. You know, it's it's just not. I think I'm um, like talking more about like text text things to do, not so much hmm. about like I think in all those examples yeah. I was really thinking about just playing SATB. Oh, okay. But, you know, rhythmically what things to try, what tempos to not go above. Um, you know, oh, what, yeah, I mean, I would say fast track. Oh, so sorry. Yeah. Like just other things like tempo and 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 uh, dynamics and things to try, things you can actually achieve when you have a much bigger choir that you can't achieve. Oh, with sure. Things like that. Yeah, I think like a big choir, that's kind of like the organ, you know, I mean, it's it can sound like something. This wall of sound, you know, plus you have 100 people on stage, right? So, yeah, I guess if you're talking about like very precision, difficult rhythms. I would not do that with all 100 voices. I would do that within one part or half a part or pull out some soloists, like pull out a quartet or an octet or something so that they can give their best singers. But yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a little bit more difficult to do those super agile things. You know, um, lining up certain consonants, uh, t, t at the end of, of a word, s at the end of the word, 
K at the end of a word, any of those really, the consonants where you can have kind of spilled k -k 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 across a hundred people is not going to be as clean. Well, there's you know? other tricks too. Like the director can say, okay, just one person sing the K. Oh, sure. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess to me, a hundred voices feels maybe more epic and that might, that might mean I choose a different text. Eight voices is more intimate. Eight voices can be real precise, but it's not going to sound super blended either, you know? Um, yeah. I don't think there's like a hard and fast rule, though, about tempo or about, about texture. You know, you think about the gigantic choral masterworks that are often done with really huge choirs, and they achieve all kinds of contrapuntal stuff. So I don't think you have to avoid that. Um, yeah, I think once you start to talk about eight or even 16, you're going to start to hear individual solo voices come out when you divide. You're going to hear individual solo voices come out anyway in, in eight part or in eight voices. So, yeah, but then you can do all kinds of cool stuff. So there's this group in Kansas City called Octarium who were like eight really, really good singers and we could write anything for them. I mean, just about within, you know, and really hard stuff. And they, you know, they were really, really skilled. So sometimes that's really cool to take advantage of that, where it's it's where you're going to get 100 singers at that level. So, yeah. But I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I think you have to think about what it, what does it speak to you? What do you want to express with that? Um, yes, we need a contest for writing art songs, for sure. Or just write art songs so that they can all be performed. What about composing songs that incorporate electronics? The challenges of rehearsing or singing with an accompaniment? Uh, I have not actually sung a lot with a stereophonic or quadraphonic track, Anthony. Um, so I'm trying to think what I can say about that. Do you have something specific that's come up or that you're wondering about doing? Yeah, about that, um, based on things that I've done, I haven't written any piece for voice and electronics. Like in my case, my experience with electronic and with electronics is with fixed media, like a stereophonic track. Mm -hmm. But it's usually been with other instruments like flute or piano, but not voice. But I have seen other pieces that are, um, songs that incorporate electronics like stereophonic or quadraphonic um, tracks and what I've noticed is that you know first of all the electronic tracks in that sense it doesn't have like a time signature it uses like um, time itself like literal time so you have a starting point and then you have like everything in natural places that I've written that incorporate electronics. I put like a starting point and then I measure in like seconds. I think you're breaking like up a little. I'm so five sorry. Five seconds, ten seconds, marks. And then towards the end, I put like what composer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, my I... connection is. So I, I guess I would say, like anything else, like any other instrument, you'd have to find a way to communicate to them, you know, whether with it's like with a click track or yeah, or whether you build that into the music. And then where are they going to get their starting pitch? And certainly, a singer can get their starting pitch from a tuning fork, which is almost inaudible to, mm -hmm. which is basically inaudible to anyone, but it's only available in like usually A, D, and E, you know. So that can be mm -hmm. that can be challenging. Um, yeah, but I think I don't think it's actually different than an instrument beyond like pitch finding or something like that. Yeah, I don't I wouldn't worry about that. So unless, yeah. unless there's something like um, what was that Milton Babbitt piece Philomel where everything's all over the place. It's like all atonal and it's like at least for me whenever I hear that piece, it's very hard for me to follow what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean again, if you if you can find the pitches, the singer probably can. And if you can't, then maybe you got to give them some more support, you know? Maybe yeah. you got to have, have something in that mix that's like, ding, before they come in or something, you know? And it's funny, like, mm. people feel like that's cheating. I don't, I feel it's really not cheating, you know? Um, so that I would just, you know, encourage you to, to yeah, think about what, what do they need? What, what would anyone need to know it's their time to go rhythmically or in time? And then 
pitch material wise, um, what uh, what can you offer so that the, here's the thing. Here's the thing about pitch stuff. And then we're, we'll move on to some other stuff. But the voice is an instrument that is completely controlled with, with the mind. There's no tactile stuff, really, to show us pitch. So you've got to hear it in your brain. you got to think it as you breathe in. Your vocal folds are going to change to the right length. And your airflow had better be just right. If any one thing of those is wrong, then you can be thinking the right note, have the wrong airflow, and you go sharp. You can be thinking mm -hmm. right now, not open your mouth up wide enough and you can squeak, mm -hmm. right? So um, uncertainty in the mind leads to uncertainty in the voice, it leads to uncertainty in the inhale, leads to uncertainty in the vocal length, leads to uncertainty in the mouth shape that also has to do with hitting that note and delivering your music and making it rock. So you can either work with us and help us do that, or you can give us a couple cool challenges that are gonna be super awesome and push us, but if the music is all super challenging, then you're not gonna have many singers who are able to devote the time to master it and really make it shine. Just like if you asked a cellist to do all the thumb positions all the time, right? Or all quadruple stops all the time, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be super feasible or all the hardest quadruple stops and now leap between them. You know, I mean, it, so so think about whatever instrument you play and what is the equivalent of that, and then use that, you know, sparingly. Um, beautiful. So there's a lot of really great, um, I love how this kind of leads us down the road of what you're thinking about. Um, a couple things I wanted to share that, I, that we haven't touched on exactly yet that I think are important. So one of them is the properties. We talked about properties of pitch finding and text stress. Um, and of course, if you are somebody who's doing like a sound based piece where it's just vowels or sound effect noises, then you get to set those however you want and not worry about text stress. But I do want you to think about the shapes that are happening in the mouth to create the sounds that we're creating. So vowel sounds and consonant sounds. We talk about vowel sounds as being in two different categories. There are forward and back vowels, and there are open and closed vowels. So if you will repeat after me, here's some closed vowels. Ooh, ooh, ooh. a. I'll have you all mute yourselves if you aren't, just so that we don't have a bunch of hiccups. A, e. So notice that on ooh, the lips are kind of closed. On a and e, the tongue does a little sit up in the mouth, okay? These are closed vowels, meaning there is less space in the vocal cavity, okay? Now let's try some open vowels. Ah, oh, ah, eh. These are open vowels, okay? The tongue is lower on the eh than it is on, so try saying e, a, eh, and feel your tongue go down. E, a, Eh, ah, now the tongue is neutral, ah, okay? So there are open vowels and closed vowels, and this has a lot to do with as we go up in range, we need to open our mouth larger, taller, and we also lift that flexible membrane in the back of our throat called the soft palate. It's this thing that lifts up when you yawn. We lift that to also create more space in the mouth, and this is required to hit those high frequencies. If we don't, we squeak. This means that singing an E vowel up high is more challenging than singing an A ah vowel up high because the, the space in the mouth is literally obstructed by your, your tongue being curved up, okay? The other property of vowels are forward front vowels versus back vowels, okay? And let's see, okay. Pulling up my notes. So the front vowels are brighter, okay? E, A, E, A, A. These are, they resonate in what we would call as singers a brighter space, okay? The more back vowels, O, O, open O, O, uh, and dark like Latin A, these are back vowels. The back vowels don't speak quite as cleanly in the lowest notes because of the resonance factors, okay? So on your very lowest notes, 
If you ask me to hang out on my lowest note on an O, it will not speak as cleanly as on an E or an A because of the properties of the frequencies of those vowels. Consonants are all obstructions of the vocal tract. They're all closures of the mouth. Mmm, b, b, or with the tongue, t, d, or of the back of the, the back of the tongue, g, k, g, k. These are all things that close to some extent the space. So this is where we get into, for singers who sing in treble clef, which are soloistically, traditionally, sopranos, mezzo slash altos, tenors who usually sing in a treble clef with an eight sign, so they sing down the octave. Text above the staff, diction starts to disappear because of the opening of the mouth. This is a land for leaping up to those beautiful high notes on a nice, tall, open ah uh, or ah uh, or o oh, or something and coming back down to finish out the word with your consonant. Okay? Uh, for people reading in the bass clef for the basses and baritones, this starts to happen around the E above middle C, plus or minus, okay? So this is another thing that is one of the most common things I see in early drafts of music from composers is that they have set a ton of text They've put a lot of words at the top of the staff or over the staff. They've seen that I can sing a high A and they've put some words on it. I don't sing a high A on words. <laughs> I mean, I do, but I, you, I don't sing a whole phrase. I don't sing a turtle fence is exactly what you think it is on a high A and G above the staff. It will have to be so opened and modified that it won't, it won't make sense to the audience and it will be very uncomfortable and the more I try to say your text correctly, the more I'll close off my space and the more likelihood that those notes will squeak. So um, you want to be aware, just like we talked about mapping the text stresses, okay? You also want to be aware of mapping open and closed vowels and consonants so that as you're writing your beautiful melodic line or your really cool uh, jagged line or whatever, you're aligning the higher notes with words and sounds that have those open sounds and you're letting us come back down into the staff for the consonant sounds. So, um, yeah. What else do I wanna say about that? That's about it. That's kind of my, that's kind of my thing. Um, I know we're kind of getting towards the end. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, let's see. There's a couple other questions and feel free to continue asking questions, but also I know some people may have to, I may have to peace out and that's fine. I drew, I do not have experience writing for singers who identify as transgender. So I am not the most authoritative person on this. However, there are some really wonderful articles on New Music Box that um, share some perspectives and strategies. And of course, like writing for anyone, it's always good to talk to who you're writing for <laughs> as you're writing the piece. And I think that is even more important when you're talking about transgendered singers because we have this problem in singing. I mean, let's just say it. We have a very, very gendered uh, discipline as singing. We have associated characters with certain pitches and certain gender identifications and certain gender presentations. Okay, this has been massively problematic because it's excluded tons of different identities and tons of different modes of expression from hundreds and hundreds of years of art song and choir and opera and musical theater. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible to have so much of humanity just not represented. And that has made tons of singers feel like there's no place for them, right? Which is another reason that we should embrace transposing things to fit individual voices so that we can be inclusive, which is another reason why we should be writing really interesting, cool operas and art songs from a variety of storytellers and librettists and perspectives. So um, I'm passionate about it. I have not yet had the opportunity to do it, um, but hey, I think you might sing. So maybe we should talk, right? Uh, yeah, so like anything really, really important 
topic and really, really important to talk to who you're writing for. And um, one of the exciting things is that Nats uh, Cascade is actually having a fantastic uh, symposium in March virtual about um, teaching transgender singers and they're bringing in experts. And so one thing that that might be very interesting for composers is to also attend that and to learn to learn about that as well. Because again, learning to teach something is also learning how to compose for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Drew, we could like, you're so on my, we're, we're so simpatico. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who, who sings bass baritone. He's like, seriously, I'm so sick of sle singing sleazy guy characters in opera. Like I'm so disgusted by all the patriarchal gross, gross characters that I play. It's really, it does not help anyone. It does not help anyone. Um, yeah. This is like a, such a huge topic. Okay, I mean, it's a huge topic to write for singers. It's a huge topic to write for transgender singers. You know, so much to talk about. And so, um, so I hope, you know, we sort of, we sort of talked about the main things, I think, pitch finding and support, vowel uh, and consonant, uh, text and metric stress. Those are, you know, if you even are new to writing vocal music or you're writing vocal music, uh, more now, if you're inspired or you're working on something, even if you take those three ideas and you really take a look at the piece you're working on, you're going to write something that will be even more effective and that singers will, will even more love. So I hope, I hope that you do that. Yeah. I'm going to like just hang out if there's any other questions. Also, if you want me to send you my handy dandy, um, cheat sheet of vocal ranges and tessitura please uh sign up on my email list and i will send you that out uh, tomorrow it's it's helpful to have that on hand um yeah Lisa, here's a, a question. Um, do you have yeah. any experience uh, writing in uh, total languages? Uh, and say it again. Uh, do you have any experience composing in uh, tonal languages? Oh, like like a Mandarin or something? Mm -hmm. I do not. Um, however, who was I talking to? Who does? Oh, I'm blanking. Um, yeah, I don't. Um, do you do you speak any of those languages? I do not. Yeah. Gosh, I'm really, I swear, I just heard a really cool piece that was sung by someone. Huh. It'll come to me. Um, and I'll, if it comes to me, I'll send it to you. I, I heard I heard a composer speaking about this, and I'm not going to be able to represent her perspective as well, because she was someone who spoke, uh, I believe it was Mandarin, and had written a piece in Mandarin. but. Um, I know that she used that to uh, uh, impact the the line, the vocal line of what she wrote. Yeah, for sure. So I wish I was an expert in that. But I guess, you know, for me, when I write in a language that's not my own, I love to take advantage of the fantastic experts that surround us. You know, the university professors are your friends, even if you're not associated with the university, or if not, they have a grad student or they have another friend who would, um, I'm sure, love to to geek out about all the cool stuff with you to help you with reading through your text in mind and and giving you some feedback on if anything in the vocal line is disrupting the meaning of the word. Yeah. Oh, you're so welcome, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, to, uh, to to respond to Ted's question, uh, yeah, I don't know too much about this personally, but like I'm sure you know Cantonese opera or various Chinese operatic traditions. Certainly, I mean, looking into that is probably a big um, would offer some very good um, directions in there. Those being the big like ones. That's a great idea.
Yay. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Kind of a um a virtual a virtual uh waterfall of great questions and discussion points that came up and um more to come. So please write write awesome vocal music and and fill the world with your songs. Thank you, Lisa. This is such yeah. a wonderful presentation. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Learned a lot. Oh yeah, my my pleasure. Everybody take care, reach out, don't be a stranger. Stay stay well, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. You're awesome. Oh, you're awesome. All right, talk soon. Bye. Yeah, yeah, have a good one. Bye. Bye.